Welcome to the Sports Card Lessons Podcast. I'm your host, Big Ken. Whether you're watching on YouTube or listening on a streaming service, please like, subscribe, and definitely leave some feedback. Welcome and thanks for being here. As promised, a collaboration episode with Sports Card Therapist. We've decided to do two episodes back to back. So Monday's episode will be a day late, uh, and that episode will drop Tuesday morning instead of Monday morning. So here, enjoy, uh, actually, do I want to say part one or just episode one of two? But without further ado, here we go. All right, everyone. Welcome to the Sports Card Therapist, where I give you a behind-the-scenes look at my hobby hustle and sprinkling some self-care and wellness on top of that. I'm Rob Gerard, your Sports Card Therapist, and as usual, I have my partner in crime with me, none other than Big Ken from the Sports Card Lessons Podcast. Ken, how you doing? Yeah, I am doing awesome. How you doing? I'm glad to be back together again. It seems like we haven't done anything in a while, so I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, I think it's probably been... Maybe about a month or so. Yeah. Yeah. Probably. Maybe. Yeah. They're always good. It's always good to come, come. So, cause we're all, we're all so busy now, right? You're doing your podcast. I'm doing, so it cuts into our, uh, it cuts into our time. We get to chat. So this is fun. I look yeah, absolutely, man. And so we are really just coming fresh off of the Philly show. Right. So we're coming fresh off the Philly show. Um, I know that we're dropping this episode um, on the same days. And uh, um, but yeah, for me, this is episode 155, 155 for me. Uh, What episode is it for you? Well, this is season two, episode 22. So wow. It would be okay. 72 so overall. 72 episodes. That's a beautiful thing, man. That is huge. 72 and i tell you like i think when when i'm in the thick of it like when i hit 72 it just didn't really seem like much to me but when i hear you say that you're on episode 72 i'm like holy crap that is amazing (laughs) that is it's pretty impressive yeah i didn't i should have looked and it just reminded me right now i should have looked but i know my one year i started is i think it may have been around either the 11th or the 21st uh, when I, when I dropped my very first one. So it's just been, been almost exactly a year. Yeah. And, and, and real quick, I mean, I'm, I'm just kind of curious as far as your perspective, right. As far as your perspective, um, what, give me one good point and one bad point about having really just being committed to putting out podcast episodes and multiple podcast episodes every single week. There's got to be a good and a bad, right? And this wasn't anything I prepped you for. So no, no. And it's, curious. and it's funny because my stepdaughter said to me tonight, literally at dinner, she, and I said, I w- we were doing this tonight. And uh, she said, do you ever feel like, oh, I have to, I have to like do my podcast. Does it ever feel like a burden on you? And I smiled. I said, no, it, it never does. And I, and I would have to say that's the positive, right? I mean, the beautiful thing about this is, I'm my own boss. I'm not getting paid. I'm doing it because I love doing it and I could be as creative as I want. So for, you know, season one and into season two, I've really been kind of following all the guidelines and listening and, you know, but now, now I really feel like I'm excited to kind of just start being more creative with the, the content I'm putting out, you know, and, the only, the only other thing I'm going to say, and I think everybody says this is, we create an episode and we're like, oh, you know, I don't know. I don't know if this was good enough. I don't know if this, you know, if, if this felt like it was a, was not even a, not even a great, but not even a good episode. Right. And then we decide to put it out there and we get, you know, more listens and all these people responding and sending comments. And you're like, oh, I, you know, it, I, I guess it was good. Right. And then there's sometimes we put out, I put out an episode. I'm like, Oh my God, this thing is unbelievable. It's going to just stir everything up. And it's like crickets. Right. So, you know, it's it just, I, I, I think the only down downfall I, I would say is when I put something, I put out an episode and I really don't get many comments back. Like I don't have people like asking me questions or giving me their feedback or their comments. Um, 
I, I think that would be my only downfall. And you know what? The, and and I'm glad that you said that because that's actually something I've touched on before, right? I, I've talked about how, um, you know, on one hand, I absolutely do content for myself. It's a passion project and it's it's something that I do for myself. And I would have never gotten to the point where I'm at in, in the hobby if it was not for putting out content. Um, you know, however, it it's yeah it's like i do do it for myself but i'd be lying if i said i did not do it for people as well because i think to an extent it's human nature to want that acceptance to want that you know to get an attaboy and i gotta be honest like if it wasn't for continuous listener feedback i don't know if i would have continued the drive to do it you know if i knew the content i was putting out was falling on deaf ears I don't know if I would be as passionate. I don't know if I'd, I'd, if I'd be putting in as much time to it. So, you know, I, I appreciate your, your honesty and a little bit of, um, you know, vulnerability and, and, and really just saying that. I think, I think being a teacher, right. Taught for 30 years and you go in and you, you know, the feedback you get, you know, how we get feedback here and what you're just talking about. But in a classroom, it's, you know, that people are learning, the students are learning, and then you're testing them and they're doing well on the tests and, and it becomes rewarding as a teacher. And I think this is the same thing. I think it's almost the same thing. It becomes rewarding because the information you're putting out there, it, people are responding to it. And, and I think for me, it, it, it's the same feeling. Um, and, and, if, and if I was to go in, and have a create a lesson plan and it just didn't work right it just motivates me to create a better lesson plan the next time or just you know when i when i'm on that same subject just do it better or figure out a new way to do it and that's the same with you know doing doing the doing the podcast right i mean we we do it the best we can when when we're doing it and we're we're 100 percent we're trying to do the best we can and if it doesn't go well then we just learn from that and, and change it up for the next one yeah. Yeah. No. And, and very well said, man. Very well said. Um, you know, so selfishly, like kind of moving this along a little bit, I don't know how much I've had a chance to really talk about any of my pickups on the podcast. And I know in the past I'm going to get like grilled for this because in the past I've, I've said like, when I listen to people's podcasts, I really don't care about their pickups, but, but I did clarify this. And I said, listen, I think what I said, it's not even that it was taken out of context. I think that I just didn't say what was on my mind at the time, because for the most part, none of this is scripted that we do, you know? Yep. And, and for me, I love hearing about people's podcasts that are true collectors. I think it's the, the pickups that I hear people talking about that I know are are probably going to be moving those in the next couple of weeks and i'll use an example fellow wolfpack member carmine carmine i love you to death love carmine he is one of the most genuine funny great dudes he knows his stuff he knows everything right but he is he is just up to his elbows and really transacting and flipping and stuff like that right so when he tells me he picks up like this gorgeous exquisite magic johnson game used jersey i'm like oh cool but i'm not super happy for him because i know there's a chance it's probably going to be gone next week you know what i mean so yeah. but then when i hear true collectors that i know are truly adding to their pcs that's what i love to hear so i've added three pc cards in the last probably about two weeks and they've been huge cards of mine to get in and i i'm kind of been on this journey recently and i don't really i can't put my finger on the journey all i know is i want on vintage on card autos of the goats now the scary thing is i don't have a ton of direction that's really the gist of my direction the gist of my direction is iconic rookie cards which it's always been from episode one i've talked about how and and we're going back over two years now i'm coming up on the two-year anniversary of sports card therapist i've talked about iconic rookie cards being at the very top of my pc pyramid however 
over time, I've really been getting into these vintage cards because they're super low pop and they are super hard to comp. And on one end, I'll overpay for one of these because it's like there's none available. So it's almost like I need to throw all previous comps out the window because this is the only one I see available. And then other times I can get it for a steal. So real quick, I just want to show you three cards that i've picked up in the last few weeks i don't know if i've had a chance to share them on the show i might have i might have not um so i got this at the laz show the last laz show that we did where we set up with the wolf pack was in full display yeah. right and yeah. this is the dr j rookie the dr j 1972 tops rookie authentic graded authentic with a with a PSA uh, auto grade of a 10. I have wow. no idea why this was graded authentic. I think easily this would be a four and I would probably much rather have a grade of a four on here than authentic mm -hmm. because I feel like when it's graded authentic, it just feels like it's missing something or like you're trying to hide something. But regardless yeah. though, I buy the card. I don't buy the grade. And uh, this is an absolutely beautiful card. So it says uh, Julius Irving, um, hall of fame 93 it's inscripted so really happy with that and this next one which is one of the biggest cards i've ever gotten in my life is the triple oh yeah it is the larry bird the julius irving and the magic johnson triple 1980 tops but guess what it's great or it's autographed by all three of them and the auto grade is a 10 and there's a numerical grade on the card of a four so it's a psa four but this thing could easily be a six or a seven i mean it's got a, a, a newer serial number on it so i would imagine if this was graded like 10 or 15 years ago mm -hmm. would probably be a six or a seven but a 10 auto for all three i mean this thing is it, unbelievable it just think of the work the work somebody put in to getting oh, yeah. all those autographs on that one card. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the luck that you had to have had. I mean, when it comes to getting these in-person autos, right, there's so much that goes into it. There's, you know, how it is that you're going to hand it to the player. You know, do you, do you put it like on a piece of cardboard and do you, um, do you almost tell him where you want him to, do it like do you cover up the card for the most part and leave a little square for him to like sign or do you just give it to him free handedly because i mean we've seen players i think it was zach wilson there was like a viral video of him last year or, or two years ago and he was signing cards like he was sitting at like a kitchen island and he was signing cards and then just like violently sliding them away from them as as he was signing them and it's like in my head i'm like he's probably doing some damage to the back of those yeah. cards as he's yeah. violently sliding them away. And then you, you the think last... you would like walk up and be like, okay, could you sign my card? But be careful, be really careful. What <laughs> exactly. Like, can I exactly. just put it down? I'll hold it. <laughs> so to get a triple auto with the auto grade of a 10, that's really cool. And the card that I just recently got, because I'll tell you one thing, Sasha P um, has been a true inspiration i've had many people that have been inspirations i think probably the two biggest inspirations that i've had on that or that i have and really they just they were i had them on the same podcast because i knew i was already going down this rabbit hole i had already had you know some jeter rookie autos some mariano rivera rookie autos but when i had on the one of my round tables the vintage in-person sign cards i I had on um, 19 signed 1933 Gaudi, right? 33 Gaudi is arguably the greatest baseball set of all time. Really, it's between the T206s, which are pre-war, the 1933 Gaudi, and the 1952 tops. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's really, there's nothing, no other set in baseball that you could really put into that category. So, um so i have a monster card by the way coming in from from my guy 1933 gaudi i cannot wait my heart is pounding just thinking about it but i don't want to get off track here so sasha p what he's doing is he's collecting on card autos of the most of, of the players most iconic rookie um, of the top 75 nba players because they just recently came out the top 75 list so like he's got a wilt chamberlain on card rookie auto 
that thing is probably like a pop 10, a pop 15. He's okay. got a LeBron James signed on card auto that he signed like two months into his rookie year. It's only a pop three because immediately after that, he signed a contract where he cannot sign cards anymore. Mm -hmm. Like that thing's, I would imagine if he put it up at auction would go for 50 K just for the LeBron. Yeah. I mean, the cards this guy has this kid has, it's insane. So anyway, so I've kind of been going down that train too. So every time I see vintage signed, if, it's a hall of famer or if it's um, part of an iconic set i'll usually pick it up so what i got was my last pickup that i just got in the mail he's a member of the nba's top 50th team and 75th anniversary team he's a hall of famer he's one of the greatest power forwards in nba history known for his offensive and defensive prowess he was the absolute First of all, he's an NBA champion in 1978. He's a 12-time All-Star, three-time All-Star first team, three-time second team, two-time All-NBA second defensive team. This guy just has stats for days, and um, and I'll show you. It's Elvin Hayes. So oh, wow. Elvin Hayes on card auto. The green screen kind of takes away from it a little bit, mm -hmm. but... Yeah, Elvin Hayes auto, and uh, I mean, That's I just saw favorite. this, and I saw that it was going for a steal. He's a Hall of Famer on the top 75 team, so I'm slowly just kind of really building these collections of these iconic Hall of Famers and these iconic goats, um, and it's it's been a lot of fun you know it's been a lot a lot of fun and, and, and what, a, um, what a great time to be alive too to be able to still have the opportunity to get these cards right because you know every time the years pass on it's the, the ability to get these cards is is going to become more and more slim right i mean people are finding them now that you know that find you know they're being it's they're being left to them in wills and you know the grandparents or their parents or things like that these cards are are coming out a little somewhat out of the woodwork right now but that's all going to come to an end pretty quick right and then beyond that those cards are is just going to be harder and harder because people people are going to pc these cards like these cards that you're getting here you're saying to yourself i'm not letting these go Right. So the, the, the chances of somebody else getting those cards there are slim to none. Right. So how, if everybody else feels the same way you do, right, those those cards are just going to become more and more scarce. Yeah. And, and you know, what I would love to say, I would love to just say a quick quote. I might have deleted the screenshot already. I hope I didn't. I think I did. Um, but if it's on his um, story, I'm just going to take two seconds to try to look it up because it was it was incredible. It was exactly what he said about what the market consists of just completely made sense. So, of course, it's gone. Um, so this is what he said. Boom. Hold on. He said. And this was Chris. Chris Hoge from Card Ladder, a friend of mine, he said, why are collector-driven markets strong? Because they're determined by buyers, or they're dominated by buyers. Virtually everyone is an end user. So when someone gets a card, when a collector gets a card, that card's usually not moving for quite some time. That's why a key characteristic of them is that cards that they have, say, only 10 copies or less, almost never sell. The primary type of seller in a collector's market is someone who needs cash to buy a different card, which explains why a card still will come to auction once in a while, even in a collector's market. Hmm. So when it's a seller's market, I mean, last year we saw these same cards constantly, constantly coming up. And one thing I want to say, and um, I know not everyone agrees with the great curator. He's kind of a polarizing figure, but he put up something that I thought was a really, really good point. I'm not saying I go by this, but for me, it was some great food for thought.
Okay. His post said this, when it comes to comps, he said that how to determine what is a fair comp. It's the negotiated price between the last confirmed sale and the lowest price currently available on eBay. Rarity favors the sellers. Availability favors the buyer. But ultimately, everything comes down to the negotiation. And I'll give you an example of this. A gorgeous 1961 Oscar Robertson rookie on card auto. Because people know I collect these. It's a beautiful thing. We talk about what we like and, and cards like come to us and they're offered. You know, it's like we're still buying them. They're not given to us, but they're offered. And I checked the last comp and the last comp was like 900 on it. And he wanted 1200 And I said, is there any way you can get down to the last comp? He said, no. I thought about it for a day. And I said, screw this, man. This card's not going to come up again anytime soon. I hit him up the next day. He goes, sorry, sold for $1,250. i am like, ah, oh, I was so frustrated. Because I don't know when the next time I'm going to be able to get a nice eye appeal Oscar Robertson on card auto because now these guys, these goats, these legends, they charge about a thousand dollars to sign a rookie card. Yeah. So, like Lou Alcindor, Kareem Abdul Jabbar, Oscar Robertson, these guys that are still alive, they charge about a grand to sign their card. Mm -hmm. So, if you can buy that card already signed and slabbed and authenticated mm -hmm. for about that price. Sounds like a steal to me. Yeah. And and a card like that, if you're within a hundred or two hundred dollars, isn't that like a home run? Like to me, that would be a home run. I know. It, it, if it was a card that I really wanted and I was that close in price, I'd be like, you know what? I be and, and I talk about this on my podcast, right? I'll spend extra if it's a card that I really want. Like I will pay a premium on it if I want it because now I've got it. I'll put it in my box and I'll and I'm gonna sleep like a baby at night, right? If I say no, 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 and I walk away from the deal, it, it churns and churns and churns in my mind. And then it, it, whether I go back or not, it just I, I felt like I lost out. And I've learned from a few of those that I just say, you know, if we can get like, you know, just in the ballpark, I, I'll pull the trigger. Yeah. And you know, what's crazy are the two biggest deals I've ever made when it comes like flipping cards, the two biggest deals I ever made, I set the highest comp of all time on both of those cards. Mm. And within six weeks, I doubled my money. Yeah. So I'm not recommending to everyone to go out and set the new high comp on a card because a lot of the stars could be fun. To, the stars need to align for that to happen. Mm -hmm. But I think my point is don't be scared to set the new comp if you truly believe in the card. Yeah. And a lot of it comes to that, right? It's like our homework is to watch sports. Our homework is to know the market. Our homework is to know what our budget is, what we can afford, yada, yada, yada. So it, it, it's up to us. You know, there, there's really no Bible on how to buy and sell cards. So we have to kind of go with our gut. And usually in most situations in life, in the hobby included, our gut will usually tell us. Yeah, I mean... It's all that feeling, right? We've all talked about that feeling gets the heart pounding and, and, and the juice is flowing. Right. And, uh, yeah, it's the worst feeling it is the, and you know, that feeling now, and I'm, I'm not rubbing it in at all because I've been there myself. It's the worst feeling to walk away and then just be kicking yourself after that. And, 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 and it's it, it, like, you want to get down on yourself. But those are the lessons I think we learn from. And um, I'll negotiate the heck out of a card. And and I may play a little hardball, but I haven't walked away yet, right? Yeah. yeah. It, you know, as long as you're still, you know, I, I'm not going to get into a deal that I that I made because I want, I'll, I'll talk about it when I get the, the card in my hand. But I, I started Sunday working on a card that I really, really wanted with somebody online, right? And... I talk all the time about, you know, pop counts. I want cars with really low pop counts. Well, a lot of those cards, they don't sell 
on Facebook or I mean on uh, eBay or on PWCC, right? So we, we a lot of these and a lot of your cards are the same way. What, what you know, we go to the shows and there's deals being made. You know, there's nowhere for someone to pull out their phone and look up what that comp was, right? So you have to start. I say go to work, right? And I've been working since Sunday. You know, since Sunday, and here it is. We're doing this Wednesday night, uh, and uh, just a few hours ago, we finally came to a, you know we finally came to an agreement on a card, um, and and it was a card without with not a lot of comps, with very very few comps on it. But at the end of the day, we were both smiling. At the end of the day, after all this negotiation we did, and it ended up with cards and cash and everything else, we were happy. But when I started on Sunday. I knew I was going to get that card. If that, if, if, if he was legit and the card was legit, I knew I was going to figure out a way to get it. Although, you know, I went back. You were still playing hardball. You were still negotiating. Yeah. Just negotiating, just trying to get it to, to, and, and, you know, we ended up where we were both happy. We're both, you know, smiling with a couple thumbs up and a, and a handshake emoji. And yeah. So uh, listen, that handshake emoji is powerful. Yeah, <laughs> that handshake emoji is no first joke. time I used that one. Oh man, I use it all the time. In my opinion, if um, you know, the word "deal" needs to accompany the handshake emoji, and if that doesn't happen, something might be off. I mean, the word "deal" is enough. Don't get me wrong, yeah. but um, but yeah, you know. So so real quick story. I had a I had a story. I had an issue happen with a buyer. Now, I have never once been accused of backing out of a deal. Okay. Never once been accused of it. Okay. Now, I am going to, I'm going to try to pull up this thread. I probably will not be able to find it. Um, so, extraordinary cards, my guy, Dave. Great guy. It's not about him, but he had posted something about about like, and it seems like there's been this extended rudeness in the hobby that has been happening. And it does tend to come from the younger generation, right? Like, like, you know, if you post a card that's for sale, they'll just hit you with HM. How much? HM. Not even like, hey, man, what's up? HM. You know, and and I know at shows I've had kids, you know, whether if they were like 10 to 18 years old, they'll they'll talk to me about a card. They'll hem and haw. I'll go down on my price. Um, I'll say, you know what? I deal. Shake their hand. And then they'll look at the card and they'll say, you know what? I'm going to come back. And I'm like, I don't even get mad. I'm like, they're kids. It is what it is. But that that is part of the stuff that you deal with. Right. So here's the thing. I'm going to read you this quick text, okay? So Dave from Extraordinary Cards, that's my guy. He posted something about uh, about sellers on Instagram. And I said, listen, this past week, I had a guy reach out to me about an Eli Manning rookie gold refractor raw. I don't have one of those. I would have loved to own it. He said that he didn't have it in hand. We discussed the price, but we never finalized the deal because he didn't have it in hand. And my answer to him was, as long as there are no issues with the card, I'll take it. A week later, he DMs me because he got the card in hand. A week later, he DMs me. He goes, "Yo, this thing is mint. I'm gonna need three. I'm gonna need three twenty five net, or it's going to PSA." <laughs> now, do you see anything wrong with that, or am I reading too much into it? No. Yeah, did you already discuss a price on it? Yes. And and was it less than the 325? No, it was 325. Yeah. It was that 325. Was so I, I might have been overreacting here. I might have been in my feelings, okay? I was planning on getting this card. He goes, yo, this thing is mint. I'm going to need 325 net or this thing's going to PSA. So you know what my response was? Have fun with PSA. <laughs> cool. Send it to PSA. He goes, oh, so you backing out? I said, no, I'm not backing out. We never said deal. We never used a handshake emoji. You didn't even have it in your hand. 
and you slid into my DMs with an ultimatum, and I don't know you like that to start making ultimatums. Mm -hmm. It's not like Ken, you messaged me and was like, yo, this thing is men. I'm going to send this to PSA if you don't want it. You know, yeah. basically, the way I read it, like this kid was trying to come across slick. He was trying to get slick with me. He was trying to give me an ultimatum and he was trying to make it sound like he was doing me a favor. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, I don't play like that. I just don't, man. Like, mm -hmm. I'm super respectful of people. Yeah. And the you fact feel, that you want to feel good about a deal. Definitely. Right? You, you want to feel good no matter what you're doing. You want to feel good about a deal. And all of a sudden, if somebody's like saying something that, you know, it may be a generational thing or whatever, but you, you felt a little disrespected, right? You felt a little, you know, a little pressure saying, you know, send me the money now or, you know, you're going to lose out type of thing. Which I would have done. Yeah. I would I would have sent him the 325 right then and there. Yeah. But the fact that he gave me an ultimatum and you know through a net which is fine right it's like what five bucks be i honestly i probably would have sent him 330 paypal and gifts and services or something you know but mm -hmm. the fact that he gave me an ultimatum and it's like i don't know this guy and for him to just slide into my dms like that mm -hmm. it just felt a bit disrespectful yeah. now did i overreact to the disrespect maybe did I want the card? Absolutely. If he would have been like, hey, man, got the card in hand. Are we good to go? I would have said, hell yeah. Yep. Yeah. But you don't you don't even know if there's a lesson learned there. Right. I mean, at the end of the day, you have no idea if there's a, if there was a lesson learned, like maybe on his side, you know, to maybe communicate a little better, you know, or or. You or know, on my side, like maybe, or maybe I, or on your side, don't get in your feel. You know, you, you have no idea if there was a lesson learned there. You know, sometimes, sometimes things rub, rub, rub us the wrong way. And, you know, that sometimes that gut feeling too is right. You know, some, some, you, I, I'm not saying who this person was, right. But when I get that gut feeling that says, uh, back out, don't do this, or something doesn't feel right, or I felt, you know, rubbed the wrong way or disrespected or whatever you felt, man, it's, it's just good to let it go. Let, let it go. Move on. And right. then the thing is too, he used like these hot take words, these hot take terms. Are you backing out? You know, it's like no one likes someone that backs out. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that's like, you know, a, a, a dealer or a seller that backs out of a deal, that's a stain on their reputation. And luckily he didn't, as far as I know, maybe he did and never got back to me. Luckily he was cool with it. And at the end and ended up posting it on his story sale for sale. You know, he wasn't like, Oh, you know, unfollow sports car therapist, you know, like, so he was cool about it. Like, yeah. Yeah. And, and my message to him was, yo, listen, I'll be the first to admit that we're doing this through text. So there was probably some miscommunication here, but what I'm saying is like for you to slide into my DMS with what appeared to be like an ultimatum and made it seem like you were doing me this massive favor by doing this, that just rubbed me the wrong way. Mm -hmm. And those Eli's cards don't pop off often. I would have loved to own it. So yeah, what, one of the other things that gets under my skin a little too is, is the, the response time, you know, you, you're in the middle of making it and they say, Oh, what do you have for trade out here? I have these cards and you take pictures and you send them off and then, you don't know, crickets, you don't hear anything back. And it could be an hour, two hours, four hours, maybe the next day. Oh, these are cool. Let me take a look at them and I'll get right back to you. <laughs> and it could, and it could be eight more hours later. They'd be like, well, I like this one. What's your, what's your price on it? You know, <laughs> you're sitting here. Are you kidding me? I already sold that card. It was delivered. To, you yeah, know, yeah, to yeah, yeah. You're sitting there thinking, good thing. I wasn't holding my breath, <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, really, if you, if you're watching on YouTube, my background is, um, the Coliseum. Right. And it's a Coliseum that is in um, Rome, Italy, and it's right at the center of the city. And this is an absolute historic, historic 
building. Um, you know, it's, it's, there's been so many things that have happened here. You know, it was an entertainment venue. Um, it hosted gladiator fights, animal hunts, and even mock naval battles. And so this is a huge, huge thing. So I, I, I put this up for two reasons. One, sometimes the hobby does feel like that. Sometimes it does feel like a battlefield and, the second reason why I parted up, put it up is because I actually use this background for one of my upcoming um, short clip videos. So if you follow my um, YouTube page, you'll see I've started posting up some shorter clip videos and just seeing, um, you know, letting people in on my uh, personal collection and whatnot. So, so that's been fun. So I decided to put this up again just because I love the way it looks. It looks great. It was, it's a great image. So. I thought we were going on vacation when you came in. I'm like, I'm all set. Ready you to know go. what, man? So my wife and I, we went to Rome on our honeymoon and we were so exhausted because we were blessed. We went on a two week honeymoon and we went to London for three days. We took the Euro, um, the Eurostar, um, train which is the underwater train high speed train it's like a two hour train you can get to paris from london like two hours took the train to paris by then we were exhausted but then we spent four days in paris then from there we jumped on a cruise ship and our first stop was uh was rome and we were so exhausted it felt like jet lag times 10 that we didn't even get the chance to fully enjoy rome we literally got off the boat and found the first place that had incredible cannolis and just chilled <laughs> we just chilled. yeah man but uh but yeah man i mean you know this obviously this episode did not go as planned but those are usually the best episodes so yeah. i'm excited to announce that we're going to be back on each other's podcast next tuesday right so you're actually going to drop your podcast a day later yeah i usually drop uh usually drop sunday night for monday but i'm going to drop monday night for tuesday perfect and and i appreciate that and thank you man and yeah. just just because i and and i had asked you if you wouldn't mind doing that just so it lines up with my drop date of, yeah. of being tuesday so i appreciate that man and uh Absolutely. you know it's always a fun time talking with you and and you and i have spoken and and i and hopefully we're going to start to do this twice a month right we're going to start doing it um weekly i have my uh i have my iron in a lot of fires right now and i'm trying to trying to balance everything out but uh you know having having a good partner like you is uh is never a bad thing it's always good content it's always sincere content and i know next week on next week's episode that we do we're going to be covering the philly show even yeah. though the philly show by that point is going to be you know a week old um, there's still a lot that I think we learned from it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There was a, you know, it's just a, a lot that we'll need to, you know, kind of break down because I think it's where the, the hobby market is going, right? Where, where the hobby itself is going. Um, we're starting to see a lot of changes. Uh, and I think these bigger shows like a Philly show, um, you, you can really get in there and learn, learn a few things. I think the Burbank show before this one, uh, what people talked about and now this Philly show, I, I think these big shows, I know it was, a. uh, uh, we'll get into it. Cause I know Dallas and there was a, the, you know, three other, sh three shows going on the same weekend. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we'll get it, definitely get into it in the next episode. Yeah. yeah. Well, Ken, listen, man, it was a pleasure, an absolute pleasure being on the podcast with you, my man. Um, you know, just always a good time. Um, any closing words on your end? Uh, no, no, I think, uh, I think that, uh, it's nice to get together, um, with you, obviously just so easy to talk to, but it's nice to be able to take what we usually talk about, right. And kind of bring it to the, uh, bring it to the masses as yeah. they say, right. Because, you know, you're talking about us getting together and doing this and, uh, you know, we talk so often and so much hobby stuff. And I think a lot of, a lot of what we talk about maybe, maybe just stays between us. Right. I think a lot yeah. of it, some, some of it's important that 
people would really want to hear. And uh, and I think it's going to be good that we're uh, moving forward. We're going to get a couple episodes a month in together. And uh, I think it's going to be really good. I'm, I'm excited. I'm really looking forward to it. Absolutely. Well, everyone, thank you so much for listening. Uh, we put a lot of time and effort into these podcasts and, uh, we know that you have very, very busy lives and, you know, we just want to thank you for taking these 30 to 60 minutes, um, a week, uh, out of your time, out of your busy schedule and making time to listen to the content that we put out because without you guys, we would be nothing. So again, a million million thank yous our dms are always open we are forever grateful for you we appreciate all the kind words when we're out there at the shows it's just uh it's amazing man so you know again thank you very much guys and uh don't forget take care of yourselves and your collection thank you have a good night rob